up tonight. Um, so sorry about all the, the delay and the mix up here with the scheduling. I, I uh, had a, a slight scheduling conflict that um, pushed things around and, and moved things out of order a little bit. So it's 7.07 now Mountain Time. I said it'd be on by 7.15. That's, uh, that's meeting deadlines right there. So thanks for being here tonight, guys. Thanks for um, your patience. And, uh, you know, we got a great paint class happening tonight. Uh, we got Eric on, on air with us. Uh, say hi to everyone, Eric. So he's going to be on air with us tonight. This is um, this is his army that I'm working on right now. Um, we've got a, an asphyxious conversion here that um, that I'm going to be painting tonight. I'm starting with working on edge etching. Um, that's basically the, the going to be the gist of the the show tonight is is um, focusing largely on edge etching. So the first thing I want to say is um, when you um, when you guys have questions because I'm I'm sure you will. Um, Hold off on those till the end, and what I'll do is I'll take the last 10 minutes or so. I'm going to clear the chat at that point, and um, uh, you guys can put in chat, you know, what kind of questions you have or, or, or things like that regarding to edge etching. So um, when I'm with um, when I'm with Eric here, I'm just going to kind of be focusing on uh, on what I'm working on with him. So, um, but I do want to answer everyone's questions. I do want to help out as much as I can. So. Uh, Let's try and do the best we can here. So a um, couple of uh, things. We've got some um, uh, miniatures coming up uh, on future paint class. We've got some, some Rapid Kings that I'm going to be doing here in a couple weeks. We've got some Retribution coming up, which are going to be pretty cool. Um, Eric has uh, the Asphyxious here. He also has a Denegra I'm going to be working on and a Death Jack as well, which we, you guys just heard us talking about. So um, so there's uh, lots, of, lots of cool stuff coming up. And and uh, I should also have my May broadcast schedule up here pretty soon as well. So, um, and then also, uh, Jason, you know who you are. This is for you real quick. We're going to channel some uh, Bob Ross. There's a, there's a tree for you. You wanted me to work it into the paint class, so there you go. That one was for you, buddy. <laughs> Happy trees, that's right. <laughs> All right, so Eric, why don't, um, before we get started here, on um, getting some uh, airbrushing done, and I'll flip my air compressor on so it can fill up. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, about your kits on you and, and the, the paint scheme that uh, you're wanting to achieve with them? We can definitely do that, and, and I know that um, we've we've sent a lot of emails back and forth. We've been talking a lot about about that purple color scheme. Um, you took a look at the uh, Cephalus on there that I'm painting right now, and he had mentioned that that purple was a little too dark. Here's a here's a quick example of that. This is uh, one of the judges I'm working on. He felt like that purple was a little too muted, so we'll kick it up a notch. Um, and ironically. As I've been kind of thinking about what colors to use, uh, War Lord Purple was one of those choices. Because you could probably stick with those same colors, War Lord Purple and uh, Texas Viper. But we're going to tweak things just a little bit. So um, what I want to do, though, now is I've got a couple of uh, PowerPoint slides. I'm just going to go through real quick with everyone. We've got a couple of uh, PowerPoint slides that, uh, that I want to go through with everyone just to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page as far as um, uh, terms and, and whatnot go. So Eric, if you have, are you, do you have your Twitch screen up right now? Um, uh, it's off on the side, but it is up in the back, yeah. Okay. Because I can hear a little bit of the audio coming through. So if you could turn that down oh. all the way. Yeah, I got you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Um, Is that better? Yeah, I th I'm still picking it up just a little bit. But um, 
there there we go it's gone now that just must have been through the delay so technical difficulties guys we got it sorted out now so um so what I want to do now is uh, I've got a little bit of a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to just show real quick to you. Just make sure we're both on the same page regarding, um, you know, different terms for uh, for airbrushing. Um, let me set this up real quick I'll, here. I'll hold on one second. Apparently my audio is really low. Okay. People, I'm going to try and fix that quick, but you can keep going. Okay. Your audio is fine on my end, and I've got your mic um, boosted, so... Um, We'll give it a second and see if uh, there we go. They're they're saying it's it's good now. Yep. Trollber Cat and and Droleth, yeah, they both are are saying that the audio is good. So um, okay. so let's go ahead and move forward with this now. Um, I'm going to put this up and go to present. And there we go. So. Airbrushing basics, and I just kind of want to start with this for a second to make sure, you know, like I said, we're all on the same page as far as terms go. Um, I know you've been airbrushing now for about a year, um, but what I want to do is just cover a couple quick basics with you. So, um, first thing is, is just kind of talking about the different components of the airbrush, and I'll go through this a little bit when we get back to the camera as far as what these parts are. But you've got your basic components are the nozzle, the trigger, the trigger, the cup, the needle, the air hose, and the body. So as I'm talking about the airbrush, these are the terms that I'm going to be using, okay? Uh, on trigger, I've got single versus double there. Is your airbrush a single action or a double action? Um, mine's a double action. I've got a Badger Chrome. Okay, you've got Badger Chrome. Okay, solid airbrush. Okay. So single airbrush, single action airbrush, you press the button, the air pressure stays the same, the paint flow stays the same. On a double action airbrush, you push that trigger down, and as you pull back, um, you can manipulate the air pressure and the paint flow a little bit um, and create more gradients and more smoother transitions. So, um, one of the most, two of the most important components on your airbrush are going to be that trigger and the needle. Okay, um, needle size is going to affect what kind of airbrushing you can do. Okay. Tonight, what I'm going to be demonstrating with is a smaller airbrush, a 0.2 millimeter needle. Um, that allows me to do more detail work, more shading, more highlighting on miniatures. Whereas um, the other one that I use, which is a 0.3 millimeter needle, that one has a larger sp spray pattern and I'm able to cover larger areas, so I use it for more base coating and um, airbrushing on jacks, airbrushing on colossals, things like that. So. Um, also, you're going to want to make sure you've got some of these tools around when you're, when you're doing airbrushing and you're doing it uh, on a regular basis. Obviously, you need your airbrush and your compressor. Paper towels are, are great to have around for cleaning with and such. Uh, Silly Putty, which we'll use a little bit tonight, is an excellent masking agent when it comes to airbrushing. And I'll show you how to do that a little bit. Um, make sure you have your cleaning stuff uh, around. I use, um, I switch back and forth between uh, isopropanol alcohol and Windex as my cleaning. Just kind of depends on what I have on hand. <laughs> um, the regulator with a moisture trap, you're going to want to have. Um, a dusk mask, you need. I do recommend that, even though, um, even though you may not be airbrushing a lot, at least just that little dust mask you can get at the hardware store. That's nice to keep some of that overspray out of your lungs. Um, I do recommend some kind of airbrush stand for you to actually hold your airbrush with when you're not using it. Um, I misspelled booth, so my apologies there, but I do recommend a spray booth. Mixing cup for mixing your paints in. Uh, and an old, an old used brush as well. That's also good to have around. Um, a spray caddy, I'm, I put there as kind of an optional thing. Um, and I'll show you what that is. But basically, it's like a Lazy Susan, something you can put your model on and kind of rotate it around um, as you're spraying. So any questions on, on that stuff, uh, other tools that you might need? Um, when it comes to cleaning items, uh, when I clean my airbrush, I was taught by friends to like run Windex through it a few times. Uh -huh. Do you feel that's bad for the airbrush? No, I, I, I don't. Um, I use, I've used a, um, 
an Iwata Eclipse. My Iwata Eclipse is about nine years old now. And I've used uh, Windex through it on a very regular basis. And I've not had any problems. I've never had to replace any of the O-rings. I've never had to replace any of the bushings or anything like that. Um, I don't use concentrated Windex. I thin that Windex down about 50% uh, when, I, when I clean it out. So it's... Um, um, that you know that's what I do it's it's not been any problems for me so I know there's a lot of there's there's different camps on that and there's a lot of people that don't think you should use Windex but I've never had any problems with it so I I keep using it so um next thing real quick just uh, regarding cleaning okay and we talked about the Windex cleaner versus airbrush cleaner a little bit um I think personally that you're fine using Windex so you know if you want to keep rolling with that what I've got here though, I've just got a quick image for you. And this is just kind of a generic breakdown of an airbrush. And I've got these different colored circles around different parts. One big thing a lot of people neglect with airbrushing is lubricating the parts. Um, there's a product made by Iwata called Super Lube. And it comes in a little blue tube. It's about $8 for the tube. But that tube should last you years. I think the last time I bought one of these tubes was like three or four years ago. So, I mean, they last a long time. And this image just kind of shows the places that I recommend um, applying that lubricant, okay? Um, right here around the nozzle section of the um, airbrush, you're gonna wanna put some, uh, some lube around those threads, okay? Just a single drop, it doesn't need a lot. Um, anywhere actually where there's threads on on your airbrush just a a tiny amount of that will help prevent those threads from locking up if they get a little bit of paint in there that's the biggest you know benefit of doing that um, do not use any kind of oil based lubricant on your airbrush so WD-40 um, gun you know oil machining oil anything like that vegetable oil don't use any of that in there um, that's going to gum things up. Just stick with stuff that's safe for acrylic paints, and that that super lube is is, is that kind of a product. These uh, blue areas here are going to also be areas you're going to want to apply um, lubricant. This is your trigger right here, okay? Um, the spring that's going to need some lubricant on it. This is a locking nut on the on the uh, needle itself that'll need some lubricant on it. And then of course the needle itself will need the lubricant. Usually what I'll do is put a couple drops of it on a paper towel and then just drag the needle across the paper towel a few times. So it's very, very simple, very straightforward. And how often do you apply the lubricant to the airbrush? Is that after every session or just once in a while? That's a good that's a really good question. I do a deep cleaning on my airbrush probably once a, once every couple months, every three months maybe. Um, when I do that deep cleaning, I completely disassemble it and run it through an ultrasonic cleaner and then reassemble it. So it's at that time that I'm providing, I'm, I'm applying the lubricant. Um, that's, that seems to be sufficient for me and I do a lot of airbrushing. So, you know, someone who's doing it on a casual basis, I wouldn't think you would need to do that more than two, maybe three times a year at the most. Um, I, but, you know, I don't know, maybe... Maybe the airbrush sitting will also, the lubricant will also kind of gel up or, or seize up. I'm, I've, I've not experienced that, so maybe they would need it more often. But the thing is, you don't want to use too much of the lubricant because that could start having a, a counterproductive effect, um, mixing with the paint and, and um, getting too sloppy. So, um, but I, you know, I would, I would think if you're breaking your airbrush, every time you break your airbrush down, you definitely want to lubricate it when you put it back together. So. Um, the next, the last slide that I have here is kind of, um, kind of a pet peeve of mine about airbrushing, just to be honest. Um, a lot of times when you're looking on the forums, you, you see people struggling with airbrushing and the typical response that you see is that your air pressure is not right or you haven't thinned your paint rights, your, your paint's right. I am, I don't believe that that's the case. More often than not, I believe it's operator error. And that's not saying, you know, that everyone out there is a bad airbrusher or anything like that. That's just saying that those are skills that need to be used. 
And these three core principles here are the three things that I think anyone who's using an airbrush need to focus on. And that's how you're using your trigger, what distance you are, what, what, what's the distance between the tip of your airbrush and the surface you're airbrushing on, and what speed are you moving your airbrush. All other factors of issues you're having with your paint, I believe are subject to these things. If you master these three principles, airbrushing is going to get a lot easier for you. And you're going to be able to do a lot more things with your airbrush than you would otherwise. Um, sure, does your paint have to be thinned? Yeah, it does. But I think the, the differences in how people thin paint is going to be so minute that that's not a huge factor. And same with air pressure. I don't think that's, that's going to be as, as big of a contributing factor as to um, why your airbrush isn't functioning the way you want it to. It's going to be one of these three things. It's going to be how far you've pulled back on your trigger, how far away from your surface you are, and how quickly you're moving your airbrush. And I'm going to do a demonstration with you here in a second to, to kind of illustrate these things and, and show what I mean. Um, so any, any questions on that, Eric? Um, have you ever heard the comparison that like, the ideal, uh, you know, I guess viscosity for your paint would be the equivalent of skim milk, where like that's how thin you're trying to get it? Yep, yep, I hear that a lot, and you know, I think that that that's a general, a good general rule of thumb. However, I'll, you know, I'll, just as an example, if you were to use, if you were to say take the color yellow and thin that down in your airbrush to the, you know, skim milk like consistency, when you go to spray it on your surface, that color is going to be so thin and so, so transparent that it's going to take you dozens and dozens of coats of yellow to cover even over white primer. You know, but whereas if you take a really um, uh, thick color or something that covers really well, a really opaque color like uh, black or a dark blue, and you thin that you could probably cover an area in, in a single coat. So a lot of thinning has to do with the color that you're thinning. And, and also the brand of paint you're thinning too. And you know that's, that's going to be something that you'll learn with time and, and it'll be a skill that you'll acquire. And that's why I say focus on these three things of trigger, distance, and speed. Because those are the skills that, that will consistently provide you results. The thinning is something that's going to come with time and, and how the color needs to be thinned or how a color needs to be applied. Those are all things that, that you'll learn as, as you go and as you grow as an airbrusher. But these three here, trigger, distance, and speed, these are the three that, that um, will really improve the quality of, of, of your airbrushing overall. And I'll show you on uh, how I thin my paints too tonight, and that'll, that'll help clear some of that up, I'm sure. So. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, back out of this screen, and we're now back to uh, to where we started, <laughs> with asphyxia sitting there. And uh, I hope everyone is, uh, you know, getting something out of this so far. And we'll go ahead and uh, hop right on to um, um, getting uh, doing some demonstration here with some inks. So. And again, uh, with regards to questions, guys, just hold on to your questions until the end. And these last 10 minutes or so of the paint cast, I'll clear the chat. You guys can put your questions in there, and we'll, we'll talk to your, uh, to your heart's content about uh, how to airbrush. Because so, I know a lot of people want to know a lot of things about this topic. So um, here is, Eric, the airbrush I'm using tonight. This is a uh, Harder and Steinbeck Infinity. Okay, it's got a 0.2 millimeter needle. needle. Um, here. That's the uh, same one uh, with this user's uh, Schnauzer face, right? Of your in his videos? You know, I've caught his videos a few times, and I do believe this is the one that he uses, or, or a variation of this one. Um, so, um, but yeah, this is, my, this is my detail brush. This has got a 0.2 millimeter uh, needle coming out the front. Um, the stem here is where my air hose connects. I have a, a quick connect feature on the on the bottom of my hose, okay? So I can switch between my two brushes really easy. Uh, this is the trigger on the top here, okay? Basic idea for those of you who are who are still learn learning airbrushing. When you push down on the trigger, you release air. 
and the further you pull back on the trigger, the more paint's released, uh, creating a denser spray pattern. Uh, this is the spray cup. Okay, on this uh, particular model, it can be broken down into to a smaller cup, which is a nice feature. It almost creates a little funnel there for you. Um, this is the locking nut on the needle back here. Um, this uh, here is for adjustment for how far back you can pull your trigger. Um, I don't use that too often. I'm not going to be using it tonight, so we won't go into too much detail about it. Uh, I will talk about this, though, for a minute. This is the nozzle cap on an airbrush, okay? And this is a unique nozzle cap because um, if you look at it straight on, you can see it's, it's a it has a vertical orientation. And I can actually spin this and give it a horizontal orientation. And what that nozzle cap does is it um, manipulates the, the spray pattern. And um, it's a little bit more of an advanced feature, but uh, you can adjust uh, whether your, sp your spray pattern has more of a vertical. Uh, uh, if it's taller vertically than it is horizontally, or if it's wider horizontally than it is vertically. So um, I'm going to do a couple, just do a quick demonstration here with you, Eric. I've got a, a, a paper card here. I'm just going to use some P3 turquoise ink. And this will kind of illustrate what I was talking about regarding how thin your, uh, thinning your paints being uh, subject to trigger movement or trigger distance and speed. Uh, inks are as thin as it gets, right? I mean, it's basically water viscosity. So ideally, you should airbrush, be able to airbrush correctly with an ink. But when airbrushing with an ink, if I'm too close to my surface, I spray all out, you know, all, all over the place. If I'm too far away from my surface, I don't have a concentrated pattern and I don't have enough control. So the idea is when you're airbrushing and you're controlling your trigger, you move, you, you move at a speed that works, Okay, and you keep your, your airbrush oriented at the right distance. And the further you pull your trigger back, generally speaking, the faster you have to move. Uh, the less you pull your trigger back, the slower you can move. And you can see with this particular airbrush, I can get some pretty darn fine lines there uh, doing some detail work. Okay, so it's not always about necessarily the paint consistency. It's about how far back the trigger's go being pulled, how quickly you're moving across the surface, and um, how far away from the surface you are. Again, closer to the surface, you're going to get a more concentrated pattern, and you're going to get that spidering effect. Okay? Farther away you are, the softer that pattern is going to be, and the more you can build a gradient and, and um, create some smooth smooth transitions. And see, just like that, I've created a nice, soft, subtle fade on the, on the card there. So it's, um, it's really about, you know, that's what I refer to as airbrush control, is, is learning those three skills. Um, there's a couple exercises you can do to help you learn those skills. Uh, the first exercise I recommend is the ABCs, and that is with your airbrush, practice writing your ABCs. Do things in cursive. Okay. Um, write out different letters. M, I, S, S, I, P, P, I. I think I missed some S's in there. I probably did. Mississippi. All right. That's one thing that'll definitely help a lot with, with um, developing that skill, is practicing writing your ABCs with your airbrush. The other thing you can do that'll help is uh, what I call lines. And what that is is um, I'll do a horizontal line right here. You create a, a dark spot with your airbrush and then fade that out. And as I'm pulling the line to the right, I'm letting the trigger go, creating that fade in the line. Okay, and you can do the same thing horizontally. 
And these are movements that you're going to use when you're airbrushing that will help develop that muscle memory to help you be an, a better airbrusher. All right, so just those two simple things. Practice your ABCs with your airbrush and practice doing lines. And that right there can help go a long way towards improving your skills with airbrushing. Uh, any questions or thoughts on that, Eric? Um, no, I've actually done the line draw a few times when I first started. Like, I would, I would make the grid and then try and place a dot in the middle of each, you know, little square. Um, and it was, it was pretty good at, you know, getting a brush control that I didn't have before. Have you ever done stuff in cursive? Uh, no, I never thought of doing the ABCs or any of that. Yeah, that, that, can, that goes a long way to, to um, improving some skill there. Um, that uh, I took an airbrush class years ago, and that was one thing that that instructor um, emphasized over and over and over and over and over and over again was uh, um, do your ABCs, do your ABCs. So I what I did, what I used to do was um, I'd get a big cardboard box, and I would airbrush it white, and then take my color, you know, take a color, a blue or a black or a green or whatever and start airbrushing on top of that and yeah I, I spent I spent a lot of time <laughs> doing uh, doing just my ABC's it got boring really fast so alright so I'm just um, rinsing this cup out here real quick and then we're gonna get on to um, priming asphyxious and uh, moving on with your color scheme what I'll do is I'm gonna prime them and then we'll um, take a minute while it dries and I just want to go over some color scheme stuff with you, and then uh, we'll get into painting on them. All right, now that I my hat, because I see a lot of your videos where you're like, oh, well, I'll give it 24 hours to dry. And since I prime with an airbrush as well, I use the uh, Vallejo Surface Primer. Because I'm in a college dorm in Florida, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to get the time to go prime. Yeah. And, and I, I have this habit of, I'll prime a bunch of stuff, but like half hour to dry, and then I'll paint it so bad. No, I don't think it was a full 24 hours and just start. And I didn't really know. I didn't know if there was a huge difference because I'm just watching your work on camera. Right, and and what I do, what I tend to, the reason why I give it the 24 hours, is um, if I'm going to be doing any brush work on the surface of the miniature, I'll I'll wait the 24 hours. Um, tonight, though, I think we'll be okay because I'm not going to be taking any brush to the surface tonight. We're, I'm just going to be doing airbrushing. So once that um, primer surface is, has dried to a, a flat sheen, you know, there's no moisture in it, it, it should be fine to, to airbrush over. Um, but if, you, if you're going to do any kind of two brush blending or anything like that, I definitely recommend waiting the 24 hours because um, two brush blending is a little bit more hard on the surface, I guess you could say. So um, I'm going to turn my spray booth on here. Tell me if that's too loud, okay? If it's uh, coming across too much. Okay. So normally I do use the, uh, well, I, I, not normally, currently I do use the Vallejo surface primer through my airbrush. Um, I ran out of black and I haven't been able to find any black, so lately I've been using um, the, this AK Interactive black primer, surface primer. It's, it's basically the same product. It's a, it's a polyurethane um, type uh, primer and it's black, so it's not going to, uh, not going to change things too much, you know. And I do thin out my, my primer. I know there's a lot of people who say you can spray this stuff without thinning it, but I, I like to thin it. I, I rarely put stuff through my airbrush at full, full concentration. So, and I only um, thin the primer probably about 30%, not very much. Just enough to, to just make it go through the airbrush just a little smoother. And I think that's more personal preference for me than it is anything else. So um, this is the black primer we're going to put on. And uh, this first layer, oh, and you'll notice on Asphyxius here, he has no head. Okay, I purposely removed his, uh, his skull head so that we can work on some OSL stuff because I know that was something you wanted to do. Uh, but when I come to, when I'm starting to prime now with this black, I'm going to be focusing most, mostly from an angle like this. Okay, 
and really trying to get the, the underside of the model coated. Are you going to be doing the uh, Yes, yeah. And, and I'm actually going to show you too, because this is a great model to demonstrate it on, um, how you can use the Zenithal to really emphasize uh, shadow in certain places and light in certain places. So I'm keeping him really, really tight right now, really flat. Um, in fact, when you see, when you look at him from this way, you hardly see any of the black primer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, those will be those will be attached uh, and painted separately. Okay, that's probably about as far as I want to go on the black. So let me clean this out real fast. You can see there's not a lot to it. I mean it. Uh, you know, it went on without an issue, and, and uh, you know, we've got black asphyxias there, or at least partially black, black asphyxias. Uh, one thing I did fail to mention, too, that probably is useful information that I'm sure someone's asked about, what air pressure am I, am I uh, currently using? I, am, um, I run at about 28 PSI. And uh, the air compressor that I use is a, uh, a large three-gallon tank compressor. It's sitting in my furnace room about 30 feet away from me. So, you know, I don't even hear it when it, uh, when it kicks on. And uh, I can run three or four of these, these airbrushes off of it if I wanted to. That's the one that I miss about being at home is I don't have my, my real compressor, which is a similar one. Uh, I'm, I have, like, a small... Um, uh, I think it's I think it's a bad air compressor or something those, but just like a noise reduction wall from another tank, it's kind of irritating to use. Yeah, does it kind of have a con does it kind of constantly run? Yeah, anytime you have the trigger down, it's going. Yeah, and those air compressors are fine for some you know for someone who's airbrushing on kind of an intermittent basis. Um, you know, I'll sit down and and I'll airbrush for you know a couple hours at a time. And I can't have an air compressor like that because it'll heat up too much. And when um, when that air compressor starts getting too hot, you can actually get a lot of moisture in the line, and you can also um, get uh, inconsistent pressures. Um, but for someone who's just sitting down for you know 20, 30 minutes at a time, those are just fine. Um, other than the fact that you know they're constantly running, which you know some people find annoying, but. Um, my my air compressor. If I sit down and I and I go for a couple hours of uh, airbrushing, <clears throat> it'll kick on maybe three times, four times. So um, it you know it hardly runs at all. I'm just uh, mixing up my primer here real quick. How much do you use primer? Because when I first started using it, I tried to thin it, and no matter what I kind of like I would always get the spider splash out of it. Right. Do you spin it more than a normal paint or Well the, the Vallejo primer, according to the Vallejo's website, does not need to be thinned. Um, according to their data sheets it says, you know, spraying through a, a 0.3 millimeter needle at thirty PSI, it does not need to be thinned. So if you're using the Vallejo stuff um, and assuming that that badger, badger is a 0.35, you shouldn't have to thin it at all if you can get your air compressor up to 30 PSI. Um, as I was saying earlier, I thin my, um, my primer down probably, oh, probably like a, like a 3 to 1 or a 4 to 1. You know, uh, so 3 drops primer, you know, 1 drop water. Um, I keep it pretty... Um, I keep it pretty close to the true formula, but um, just a touch on the thin side. So I'm applying the white primer right now, and I'm really focusing on 
um, this arm right here, and then also on the top of his cape right here. And I kind of want to have those be some um, really strong highlights right through that area right here uh, as we go to paint the model. So as I'm doing the zenithal priming, those are kind of the areas that I'm going to focus on the most. The other thing you'll notice about, about my primer too is I'm not going totally opaque with the primer. Uh, I actually like to apply it very thin. First off, because I don't want to obscure the detail. And uh, secondly, um, because I believe the thicker that you apply the primer, the less, um, the more difficult it is for paints to uh, adhere to it. Okay, so you want to um, keep those layers thin and make sure they have a good tooth to them or a good uh, uh, amount of uh, ability to have paint stick to it. looks pretty good there. That primering looks nice. I want to see if I can build this up just a little bit more right down here on the cloak. Okay. Yeah, that looks better. Okay, so I'm going to let that sit for a bit and I uh, want to take a break for a second now and clean out my airbrush real fast. And let me show you uh, one of the things I use to clean with. This is an airbrush cleaning pot. Okay, you can pick these up at um, Harbor Freight, most hardware stores. I know Amazon has them. Okay, um, nice thing about them is you can spray your cleaner into them without getting fumes everywhere. There is a little bit of a small filter on them that does kind of filter out some of the, the particulates and also a little bit of the odor. So being in a dorm room there, Eric, it might not be a bad idea to pick one of these up. Yeah, I, I have one made by Iwata and I love it. it yeah. It, you have to put the brush down. You might have a little stand, like a quick stand for the brush. Yep. So rest them here, it's really nice. Yep, and that is one, that is one way you can use it too. Um, this nozzle right here, you can just slide your brush in there and let it hang. Um, I've got an a airbrush stand off, off camera here that I use. So, uh, But what I do when I'm cleaning is uh, I'll run my cleaner through the, through the cup, and then I'll add a little bit more cleaner into the cup. And I'm sure this is going to make some people out there cringe, but this is just how I do it. Um, and then while I'm spraying it, I'll just take an old brush and make sure... I'm cleaning that needle off on the inside in there and kind of working that trigger back and forth a little bit until that whole chamber is empty and that really cleans things out on the inside quite nicely and then after that cleaner runs through I'll just add a squirt of water do the same thing but I don't get aggressive with the brush and then the last thing I do once that water is empty is um, I use a touch of this stuff here, um, Windsor & Newton Brush Cleaner & Restore. It actually uh, helps break down acrylic pigments. And I'll put a couple drops of this in there. And that just, I, I don't even know fully what it does, but since I've started using it, I've had a lot less problems with clogging and um, issues with my needles. So. Um, I think it just helps uh, clean that needle off just a little bit better. And then once I spray that through, again, quick, quick rinse with water. And I'm ready to move on to the next color. But before I do that, though, let's take a look at your color scheme here real quick because I want to make sure we're on the same page as far as what colors you're wanting to have done.
Okay, so let me share this screen with, uh, with everyone here real quick. This is, the, um, this is what I use when I'm wanting to uh, um, play around with color schemes a little bit. It's called uh, Color Scheme Designer. And while it doesn't, these don't match up to paint codes for Vallejo or P3 or anything like that, what it helps me do, though, is, is kind of identify what colors work together. And I think that's a really important thing um, uh, when, you're, when you're designing a color scheme and trying to figure out what colors work is, uh, you know, how can they complement each other, what's going to work with them. So I was playing around with some different colors with yours. Um, you've got different schemes that you can use across the top here. Monochromatic, complementary, triad, tetrad, uh, analogic, and then uh, accent accented analogic, excuse me. And um, as I was playing around with the purples, this was kind of the one that, that struck me the most as, as I think would work the, work the best with what you were describing. Um, a nice solid purple color as the core color. Okay, um, accents with magenta, which is probably what we're going to push your highlight towards, is, is a little bit more of a pink highlight as opposed to just a light purple. Um, working some blues in there somewhere. You've got your golds in here, okay, from down from a green-based, gritty, ugly gold up to a nice bright highlight on the gold, okay. And you were saying that you wanted a blue glow for your. Um, uh, for your cricks, but I almost think we should do a, a light purple glow. Um, something like um, uh, frostbite with, with just a touch of purple mixed into it. Um, I think it'll tie, it'll tie things together a little bit more. Uh, the blue, like you know, if we, were to, if we were to move this color wheel here and come down to a, a more light blue, more of a ghostly blue like what you wanted, you start to get more into the blue purples and oranges than um, than where you were up here uh, with the stronger yellows and the stronger purples. Uh, what wh what do you think on that, Eric? I'm done to see it. I mean, the the color I was kind of thinking of for the and what I've been using was like uh, very similar to the Magnus or not Magnus, um, the pink solo sword that you did like the first stream. Oh yeah, the uh, coal black. No, 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 no. It was. Um, I think it was the turquoise tank. A uh, use of that. But oh, I'm you're. Down to see what the, the light purple could look like. You're talking about um, um, in this area here. Hold on a second. Let me. Um, everyone's seeing my emails there. I probably shouldn't Maxim do it. Maximus is the name of the solo. Yep, yep. Let me um, let me go to it here. I've got a picture of it. Make sure we. We're on the same page with this one. Right here. So you're talking about this glow right there, right? Yeah, that's that's similar to what I've been using on mine. Okay. Yeah, and see that was uh that was based with uh frostbite, highlighted with Moro white, and then washed with turquoise ink. So I, I'm intrigued by the, the the idea of the purple glow though, with uh, you know, dark uh, deep purple and then like magenta highlights. So I I wanna at least see that before I okay. anything. Okay, and you know that's the wonderful thing about painting miniatures. If if we don't like it, we can uh, we can fix it. We can go back, you know, and 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 redo something. That's not an issue at all. Um, and you know what I'm talking about with the purple glow. And I wish I had time to, um, I wish I had had time to to put something together for you. Maybe I'll do something before the next time we meet. And um, it's it's a really it, what I, what I'm envisioning is something really soft, a really soft purple glow almost to the point that it, it still looks like a white glow, but it just has that hint of purple to it. You know, if you could imagine something, um, something kind of like in this, in this area right in here, but lighter still. You know, if um, I was actually using a that for um, like flesh tones on my mechanic brawls and stuff. Oh yeah. But yeah, that that's how I was just, like trying to differentiate the units and something I was going to talk to you about when we got the Tanagra. Okay. Skin. But um, 
Yeah, I, I still really like to see this as well. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Well, you know, right now, tonight, we'll work on the base coat, and then, uh, you know, we'll see where we go from there. So, so let me uh, pull this screen off, go back to our camera there. <clears throat> see here and we're uh where are we at time wise on here so we've been on about uh just under an hour so we're good okay so um for the base coat on uh, on on your army for the purples i'm going to recommend airbrushing first off just straight uh hexed lichen that's where we'll start at for your base coat and then um, what we'll probably do next is uh, apply the shadows on here. And then um, I'll pull out the Silly Putty and uh, we'll, we'll do some highlights and I'll show you how we'll put the highlights in here. So uh, does that sound good? Uh, yeah, sounds like a plan. All right. So um, earlier I mentioned one of the tools you need uh, is mixing cups. So I got these off of eBay <clears throat> for about a hundred. Oh, I think I spent like ten dollars for like a hundred of them. They're pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive. They're good to have around. And I'm just gonna throw some of that in there. And the airbrush thinner that I use is the Vallejo airbrush thinner. Yeah, I've been using the same one. Yeah. And I'm probably doing about a probably about a 50-50 mix to start with is what I'm I'm guessing that is. And I still think that's probably just looking at that. I think that's a bit thick. Um, can you see um, how I'm pulling that paint up on the numbers there? How well is that coming through? Uh, it's it's you know like you're not really seeing them too hot. Yeah, that's kind of an indication that you're too thick, okay? So ideally, when you uh, pull the paint over those numbers, it should almost act like, like a wash in a way. So if we... Like you said, you want to be airbrushing with almost an ink. Right, yeah. Th and that's my preference of how... That's how I airbrush. You know, some people are, are going to do it different, but that's, that's my preference. So I think we're, we're pretty pretty well mixed there as far as thickness goes. I'm just going to add a, one more little bit. There we go. That looks good. All right. Dump that into the airbrush and we'll start applying your base coat. Now when you're working with zenithal highlighting like we've done here on Asphyxius and you're applying your base coat, you don't need to be as concerned with complete coverage at this point. Okay, so you know you've got all that black on the underside there. Okay, so don't worry too much about trying to cover all that area. Where you really want to focus on getting your base coat color at right now is all everywhere you're seeing the white. Okay, and I'm going to focus mostly on the cloak here as I airbrush. And I'm not trying to get into all the little nooks and crannies yet, okay? I'm just trying to get a nice, solid, even coverage over all the white area there that you're seeing. The nice thing too about using an airbrush in conjunction with actual brush painting is you can really move a lot faster. I mean, could you imagine how long that would take to, to base coat that? <laughs> that was the primary reason I got an airbrush. Was, yeah. was like to get base coats down and stuff, but I really enjoyed doing it, so I started trying to practice to get more proficient with it. And you know, you can't see my airbrush position on the camera, but I am holding fairly far away right now because I want to have a wide pattern with my airbrush. So I'm probably about three or four inches away from the surface right now. And the thing with airbrushing, you gotta you gotta build that layer up slowly. Okay? 
I've probably got my trigger pulled back about 40% of the way and I'm just working right now on making a nice solid smooth layer. I'm not trying to get into all the nooks and crannies I'm just really focusing on putting a nice solid layer down on these upper surfaces. You see how that's looking. It's a nice looking purple. I like this color. Yeah, recently it's like some of the uh, Vallejo uh, game eggs, and they don't have the uh, X uh, lichen anymore in purple, which is kind of a bit darker. Oh, yeah? But it still works pretty well. So you're, t you're telling me I need to run over to the game shop and, and clear out the shelves of this color then? Um, but they still sell this in game time. But like oh. pushing out the air brush range. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. The air brush range itself does not include text like it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, so now that we got a nice solid layer there, what I'm going to work on now is um, getting into some of these tighter places a little more. and just evening that color out. All right. So I think that's going to be our, um, our base color right there. That looks pretty good. It's a little darker on the screen than what it is under my light here, but um, we'll lighten that up. Now, as far as the, uh, the shade color, we're going to go pretty dark on the shade color, okay? Uh, oh, before I get too far into that, let me just say real quick, when you're working with similar colors like this, um, so the shade color I'm going to make for you is a, is a purple color, I've, or, I've got purple paint in my cup. My cup is empty now. I've emptied it out, okay? And I've got some purple here in the mixing cup still. I'm going to empty that out too. There is nothing wrong with mixing your shade color right into these, um, you know, mixing it right into here and then pouring it right into here. There's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, when you're working with similar colors, you don't necessarily need to clean the cup out all the way before, before switching to, that, to another similar color. Okay, so blues and greens, um, reds and purples, uh, browns and blacks, um, whites and yellows. If you're kind of moving from one color to the next like that, you don't need to necessarily do that. Okay. Now, if I was going from like purple to white, yeah, I'm going to clean this cup out. Uh, if I was going to uh, from purple to blue, I may at least run some some uh, Windex or some uh, isopropanol through this uh, once or twice, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time. In, in detail cleaning it. Um, it just saves a little time. Um, when I'm done airbrushing completely though for the night, I'll clean that cup out all the way, but it just is a kind of a time saver. And you're not going to have that big of a color jump uh, between those two, uh, between two things like that when you're color changing. Okay. So let me get your uh, get the colors that I'm su going to suggest for the uh, for the shade. We're actually going to build you a custom purple for this one, and for that we're going to go to P3 paints. We're going to start with beaten purple, sanguine base, and coal black. All right, those are going to be kind of the three the three colors that we're going to use. So we got coal black. Sanguine base and beaten purple. We'll start with about um, probably going to do beaten purple and then uh, like a one to two mixture of the sanguine base, like one one part sanguine to uh, to about two parts coal black. So four parts, so what that breaks down to is four parts beaten purple, one part sanguine base, two parts coal black. 
the uh, beaten purple to the uh, hex lightning. I'm beaten purple as well, but I was just curious how similar those two colors. They're they're pretty they're pretty darn similar. If I hold the hold them up here, the the hex lichen is a touch darker. You can see that there on the screen. But this should give us a nice uh, a nice dark uh, purple to work with. If it's uh, not dark enough, we'll add a little bit more coal black. If it's too dark, we'll start bringing it back to purple um, by adding more beaten purple to it or more uh, sanguine. So you see how dark that is? That definitely takes yeah. us down a notch. And the other thing too, um, Eric, about uh, airbrushing is once we get this shade color on, if it proves not to be dark enough, you can always go back in with a brush and some like you know, straight coal black to really darken things up a bit if you want. And we'll probably do that to be honest. In like a glaze or a two brush blend type of Yeah, thing. yeah. All right, now here's where the magic begins. Here's where the fun begins, okay? Um, we're going we'll to we're gonna use the airbrush to start applying this shadow. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go back to how I was holding the model when I was doing the zenithal highlighting. So kind of in this type of a fashion, and I'm going to hit this, these bottom edges all the way around. Um, you know, just a few passes here to build up that dark purple and to give that black that's already on there a little bit more of a purple a purple hue. So you're using the black primer as part of the actual shade itself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And this isn't a a shade you're going to see too much in the final product to be honest. Um, you're, you're mostly just kind of doing what's called color modulating at this point on the black, where you're taking it from less of a black to more of a purple. Okay, that's probably good there. And he, now here's what we're going to do. So you can see, let me set this down and not try and point with my airbrush. <laughs> that would be bad. Okay, so where are we going to apply the shadow? Okay, well, if you were to hold this, you know, directly under the light, it would cast the shadow down to show you where a lot of those those shadows are going to be on the model. But since I have to hold it flat and it washes those areas out, I'm just going to point out where I'm going to shade at. I'm going to shade right under here. Okay, probably put a pretty heavy, heavy, uh, heavy shadow there. Same in here on some of these. Uh, these creases. Um, I'm going to come pretty heavy back here on his back, back side of his cape, just kind of globally applying the, the shade color. Um, and then follow some of these folds in his, um, in his robe down pretty far as well. And then focusing right in this area too with that shadow color. So when doing shadows and highlights with your airbrush, you want to, um, you're going to be pretty close. This, you can see how close my, my tip is to, to the surface there. I'm probably about an inch away. So you're only going to pull your trigger back about 20% 20, 20 maybe. And you're going to want to build that shadow up very slowly. Okay, if you have your trigger pulled back too far at that close of a distance, you're going to spider the, um, the paint. In other words, you're going to get runs in the paint. Now, alternatively, you could lower your pressure, but um, That's what I was just about to ask. yeah, you could lower your pressure, but I I don't like to fiddle with that. You know, I like to set my pressure and leave it. Okay, and I focus on using my airbrush to give me the results that I want, not necessarily the air pressure. Um, the pl the paint's plenty thin enough. It, it's it's going to be fine. Um, what it so what it is at this point is is having the trigger pulled back the right distance and, and making sure you keep your speed um, consistent and making sure you keep your distance consistent. Distant consistent. Okay.
Right, and so you can already see applying that shadow in there. I'll do the same thing here. I'm going to focus right in here underneath this, this cloak. So you can already see how how that uh, how that shadow is building up. I I think it should go a little darker, but um, we'll see how it looks uh, once we're all done here. You, did you see what I just did there, real quick? how I pulled my airbrush off to the side and pulled the trigger a couple times. Yeah, you ever want that, like, what do they call it, that small buildup on the nozzle to splatter all over what you're working on, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, when you're doing fine detail work like that, um, you need to pull back that trigger a couple times like that, and it just kind of cl clears off that um, um, paint that's drying on the tip of the needle. So, and when you're working with a yes, small, right. yeah, and when you're working with a small tip like this, um, that's what she said, um, you're going to get a lot of dry tip really fast. So. Yeah. So I'm building up that shadow on the back side there. Okay, so I think that's about it for the shadows on the uh, on the purple. Is that too dark? No, that's actually like ideally what I was looking at, and then the highlights okay. you said going for more magenta, and that was perfect. Okay, well, let's do some highlights real quick. Let me. Um, the, um, one thing I was wondering was um, with the uh, this may be getting a bit ahead, but like with the armor plates and stuff. Uh, what kind of colors are you thinking for that? Because I'm looking at, like, thinking of how this is going to translate to Bane brawls and all that good stuff. Right. So, curious. Well, you know, and one of the things that I focus on in these videos is, you know, techniques that will help you get your army on the table as, as fast as you can. And, you know, with Bane thralls, you know, you've, they've got a lot, of, they've got those big shoulder plates on their, on their, um, um, on the model. Um, and then they got the big flowing robes. As much as possible, I would recommend, especially since you have an airbrush, I would recommend airbrushing your purple on there as much as possible before attaching those, those shoulder plates, before attaching those uh, components that are going to be painted in metal. Um, and then paint those components separately. Um, did you catch my Centurion video? Um, I'm actually like halfway through part two. Uh, it's just been, you know, firm paper and such. Sure, sure. So you, you've seen how I, I paint the centurion. I'm painting the centurion in pieces. Um, I would I would recommend the same thing with your banes. To be honest, um, it it will allow you to uh, maximize the things you can airbrush um, while minimizing the amount of overspray. Now to address your question as far as what color, um, we're gonna. I, I would keep it pretty gritty. So I was thinking. Um, a uh, uh, base coat of pig iron uh, with some highlights and cold steel and then washed with um, the secret weapon miniatures armor wash. Their armor wash is really kind of gritty and dirty looking. It has more of a brown uh, oily uh, look to it as opposed to 
the P3 armor wash that is more of a blue or a purple, a cooler tone. And then um, what I can do, I don't think I... I don't think Denegro would be the best one to do it on. I may have, um, what I may do with you on that is um, I've got some Arcanists that I'm painting that are going to be in plate mail. I'm painting their armor to be silver. So um, when I uh, get to that point, I'll post up a video of them, of painting them, so you can see how that would look, um, airbrushing the metal on while still... Um, taking advantage of like a black primer coat to create some sh some shadow. Awesome. So for your um, asphyxius here, I think he's going to be dry enough for me to uh, um, add some silly putty on here. I'll just have to be really gentle with it. Um, what I recommend for this, when you're doing this type of stuff as far as using Silly Putty to create a mask, uh, get yourself either some dental tools or a nice uh, toothpick. Pull your Silly Putty out of its little egg. And where I'm going to put Silly Putty at is uh, right in here, because I want to I want to create a pretty strong highlight right here. Okay. Um, a highlight along here I'm going to be able to do by hand, so I'm not going to be worried about that. Um, I'm also going to put a little bit of Silly Putty along this edge right here as best I can to create a nice strong highlight right here at the bottom. And then I'm going to put a highlight right here along the bottom, and that I'll do by hand. And um, yeah, I think that'll be good. So let's... Uh, Is there a um, big difference? Silly putty blue tack uh, I've never used blue tack to do this. I'm not a fan of blue tack. Um, I tried using blue tack once to hold a miniature to a cork like this and had really poor results with it. Um, it's entirely probable that I was doing it wrong and most likely that I was doing it wrong. <laughs> um, I'll be the first to admit that. But um, yeah, I've just never had good results with uh, with blue tack. So. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary, so. Now this one here, along this upper cloak here, this is going to be a little bit tighter uh, to fit in there, so I'm going to kind of piece this one together. And really, I'm mostly interested in that highlight being right here at the bottom mostly, so, so I'm not going to worry too much about the top here. Yeah, the, the, the Kraken that you sent me pictures of, man, it, it looked pretty good. I was impressed. Uh, painting... Coming from you, that, that kind of means a lot, so thanks. Well, you know, painting a Colossal, anyone who, who gets a Colossal painted or um, a Battle Engine painted, my hat's off to you because I've painted... I, I'm probably... I'm uh, Honestly, and, I, and I'm not boasting here by saying this, but... I'm probably getting close to a hundred different colossals and gargantuans and battle engines that I've painted. And um, I don't know if that's a lot. It feels like a lot to me. And so anyone who can... Who can that's, that's a good amount of, you know, plastic and resin you're getting. So. <laughs> well, yeah, and, you know, anyone who can get through one of those things, um, I just, I have respect for you because uh, those are just, those colossals get tedious man and, and and I used to build model uh, cars planes and trains of thousands of parts and you know I would still almost rather do one of those <laughs> than to do, do some of these colossals the, my, my big problem is, is I always find myself wanting to paint big tools or I gravitate that's why I picked up convergence as my second faction where I want to paint a lot of you know huge colossals and I find that to be the most fun to work with I hate that convergence colossal, and I've painted three of them, I think. Oh man, that's <laughs> unfortunate. I've been um, like my convergence is more like a labor of love, converting it to be um, one of the main characters. Max from a favorite cartoon of mine as a kid. So. Which cartoon? Uh, you ever heard of Gone? It's uh, 
the the main character's mech, its primary weapon is a drill. Oh, so I saw cool. that and I'm like, I have to. It has to happen. <laughs> I've never heard of that cartoon, but I props for wanting to to relive your childhood, man. I can I can I can dig that. So um, those are the two uh, the two places I want to put the silly putty. Okay, I'm gonna actually pull this one back a little bit since I'm putting a highlight right there. I don't want to create a hard line there. That should give me enough room to get in there. And basically, I've used the toothpick just to kind of form the silly putty to the edge of the cloak. Okay, and I think this is going to add a nice a nice bit of contrast to the purple, and you're really going to start to see things pop uh, with this. And I'm going to thin this uh, warlord purple a little more than I did the uh, hexed lichen, because um, I want to really build that that gradient up slowly. I don't want it to be too overpowering. With airbrushing, you can always add to, but it's very difficult to take away. <laughs> so, you know, kind of remember that that rule of thumb as you're um, you're airbrushing and painting your own miniatures. Okay, and then once I put these highlights on, we're probably going to uh, stop for for the night. Um, so, for those of you who um, have questions who are still around. This has kind of been a longer session. Um, so for those of you that have questions that are still around, um, get those questions ready to go. I'm going to clear the chat here in about three or four minutes um, so that uh, you can put those up there. And I'll take some time to address Eric's specific questions and then uh, ones that you guys might have as well. Uh, now Eric, with applying this highlight, one of the things that, that uh, is a good skill to have with airbrushing is learning the direction to spray from. Okay, we talked about that a little bit. You know, when we did the xenophil priming from below. Okay, so intuition would say our highlights we want to spray from this direction, and that's that's correct. Okay, but you don't want to uh, spray it just top down globally like this. Okay, you want to keep your highlights localized. So as I'm working on the highlights right here at the tip of the of the cloak here, I'm going to be spraying from this direction. Okay, As I'm working on the highlights right here at the bottom, I'm going to be spraying from this direction. Um, so we, you want to make sure and not to get the overspray of your highlight onto the overspray of where the shadow was. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's working pretty well. Okay. So yeah, I can see that. All right, so I'm going to start right down here at the bottom, um, this edge of the cloak here. Yeah, look at that, that's nice right there. That looks good. That's literally what I was hoping for. Awesome. When, uh, when you were getting this pumped out. Awesome. That's what I love to hear, man. It's going to be soft. It's going to be subtle. One thing with a, a lighter color like this that is a little more difficult is it's hard sometimes to tell just how much you've built the color up until sometimes it's, it's almost too late. Yeah, I had that problem early on where I would you know, try and get a highlight going and it would go from one extreme to the other and it would look like I never even mixed the two. It was just a... Uh, well, and, and I think it was in my one of my cane videos that I talked about not being greedy, you know, and you just kind of gotta let it build up slowly, you know, and that that same 
That same principle applies here. All right, I think we're good. Let's uh, let's pull this back and see what we get. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. That's that's looking really good. And you know what? When when we when we get into the two brush blending part here in a few days, um, we can really clean this up and refine this a lot more. Um, I'm actually really liking that as it is. Um, I think uh, I think this is good. I think we could pull this highlight a little further up. Let me just do that real quick. looking better. Yeah, and one of the things we'll be able to do when we start the brush work on this guy is, is really cleaning up some of these highlights and um, pushing them just a little bit further and just creating that, that little extra bit of contrast to, um, to really make them pop. I think we're good right there, Chris, or Eric. All right, so I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to come over here now and uh, clear the chat so that uh, all those questions that uh, you guys are wanting to ask, you can ask. And uh, while that's going on, Eric, what other questions do you have? Uh, what's your preferred way to go about three models? Can you say that again? What's your preferred way to go about stripping a model, like using simple green or some other type of uh, like solution? Um, what I do is, first off, if it's plastic, I don't strip it. I, I just repaint it. Um, the P3 plastics do not, um, do not strip very well. Um, so if I, if I don't think I can... Um, reasonably repaint a plastic model, I write it off, it goes into a, a, a bits bin, and I, I get a new one. Um, as far as the uh, um, metal models go, uh, I use an ultrasonic cleaner. I use um, Purple Power. It's a degreaser I get at Walmart for like five bucks. It's super cheap. I dilute that about 50%. And then I bought a ultrasonic cleaner from um, Harbor Freight for like 20 bucks, and I used a 50% off coupon for a Super Saturday sale type thing they were having, and um, was able to uh, you know pick it up for like 12 dollars. <clears throat> and um, then I, I take a a clip, like a metal you know those those black clips that you uh, can use for like paper clips and the silver arms fold down. Have you seen those types of clips? I'll, I'll, I'll use... Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay. You can link one to me. Yeah, That's yeah. Quite yeah, I use one of those to, like, permanently press down the on button on the ultrasonic cleaner and then just let it, um, you know, let it do its thing for, like, maybe an uh, hour. Like the, the thick office paper clip. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And then, you know, I'll let it sit in the, in the ultrasonic cleaner for about an hour and then it's um, the paint literally falls off of, of the metal models. So that's that's kind of my, my thing to uh, that's how I, I strip uh, that's how I strip models. I got a feeling some banes are gonna be going in there real soon. <laughs> are your banes still metal? Uh, yeah, okay. I have uh, uh, twenty plastic thralls, thirty metal uh, uh, twenty metal thralls, thirty metal knives. You are a bad person. It's like, it's like ten of each painted. You're a bad person, Eric. If you if you're going to drop that on someone. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, but the thing is, like, I, I haven't used uh, the Pretty Knights all too often, actually, if you don't mind going to, like, a game talk real quick, because I've been using this a lot in place of that third unit, and I like Oh, I, I don't mind doing doing um, uh, game talk. I'm I'm a horrible War Machine player, man. That's why I'm a good painter. <laughs> I spend all my time painting that. Fair enough, fair enough. I, you know, I'm try I want to be a hybrid of some kind. You know, I, I like I like my models looking good. I like to be able to place pretty well every now and then. Oh, I, I gave up on that a long time ago, man. <laughs> But I'll tell you what the worst thing is, Eric, and I don't know if you've heard me mention this before. I, I was, you, you know Trevor from Chain Attack, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Trevor. Okay. So I, I painted his Scorn Army for him, and um, not so much now because he plays Legion now, but when he was playing Scorn last year, I'd, I'd roll into the store, I'd put down my Menoth, we would play, and, and let me tell you, it's, a, it's not a fun feeling getting your butt kicked by an army you painted. I've never even thought of that. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't even have those. Oh, man. I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, and Trevor would probably not be happy with me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you want to beat Trevor, start touching his models. He's very particular about his models, and that will get him worked up. It will it'll rattle him a bit. So, uh, the kryptonite yeah, yeah, that's his kryptonite. <laughs> so... All right, so Eric, what uh, what other questions do you have before I um, take start taking some of these questions from uh, from chat here? Nothing really. I mean, okay. it's just uh, I really enjoy what we're working on so far. Okay, so next next time um, I broadcast on on your um, um, uh, on asphyxius here, what I'm going to do is we're going to mask off the purple. Okay. And we're going to airbrush the the metallic uh, for his upper torso, okay? And then um, we'll remove the mask from the purple. We'll kind of refine the purple a little bit more with some brushwork. But you know, looking at it, it's not going to need a lot. It, it's looking pretty solid. Um, and then we'll start getting into the metals. Hopefully, um, one more session on the, on asphyxius, he'll be done. Might carry over into a third one. But we can talk in email about when we'll be on next to uh, to cover that. So um, yeah, I'm free all tomorrow's my last day of classes, and I don't hit the road to go back home until the end of the month. So I am literally just doing nothing. Uh, my schedule's free. All right, all right, awesome. Well, we'll we'll definitely make something work, and and I'll hit you up on email here in a day or two about that. So so let's uh, let's look at chat real quick and and. Um, answer a few questions there and, and Eric if you've gotten any feedback on these too uh, feel free to chime in but uh, the first question is from uh, Plarzoid or I think that's how I say it he's pretty uh, pretty uh, um, frequent poster over on the privateer press forums um, he's helped me out with some uh, some stuff before he's a he's a good painter he's one I look up to he's, he's got some good skill so he's asking uh, how do you avoid tip dry and how do you deal with it mid-session that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I I honestly don't experience a lot of it. Um, I don't know if that's the temperature here in my room, in my in my paint studio, or or what, or how I thin my paints. But I gen I generally don't have a lot of it. Um, one thing that I do when I'm airbrushing is particularly if I've held the trigger in a, a certain position for a long time is I'll clear that trigger by pulling my airbrush off of the surface I'm airbrushing and pulling back a couple of times on the uh, on the trigger and that that clears off any uh, any um, muck that's that's there on the on the end of the brush um, the other thing that I do is I'll take a either an old brush or a Q-tip depending on what I have access to and um, put a little bit of cleaner, airbrush cleaner on that and then just gently rub the tip of the needle um, with that Q-tip or that brush to, to clear off that, that dry tip. But generally speaking I, I, don't, I don't experience it much and I've noticed that I don't experience it as much anymore since uh, switching to the Vallejo airbrush thinner. Um, it I seems. Was say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
that thinner, it stopped. But if it ever does happen, like what I would do is just take Windex, spray it into the paper towel, uh, retract the needle a bit, and then just hold the uh, paper towel at the front and just air through it real quick and it cleans it right up. Yep, yep. And the other thing too is the um, the acrylic brush restorer that I, I mentioned earlier. Using that has also minimized a lot of the dry tip that I was getting there for a while. Um, the next question also comes from uh, Plarzoid, um, and he's asking um, what my paint setup was, I think. Yeah, what does my filming setup look like? I'm probably going to post a picture of that um, here at the end of the month. I'm still transitioning into this paint studio since I just got it built. Basically, I have a camera at my painting station, I've got a camera at my airbrush station, and I can post pictures of that uh, here a little later. Uh, next question we have comes from Numlock. Uh, where do you even find Silly Putty? Uh, Target is where I've found it in the toy aisle, and I've also found it in Walmart at the toy in the toy aisle, and specifically the part of the toy aisle where the cheap dollar type toys are. So um, that would be where I would look. Uh, online would also be another place. Uh, Brackwall's on tonight. Great. How's it going, Eric? Glad you're here, man. I'm glad you use the ultrasonic cleaner as well. Uh, Drollath. He's asking, how do you avoid the overlay airbrushed fill that some models get? For example, I would point to most of the Jolly Roger Studio models I've seen, or do you not worry about that? Yes, um, when you are airbrushing a model a lot, you can get, I, I call it the airbrushed look, the soft airbrush look, and you can even see it here on Asphyxius a little bit. Um, I think part of what's helping him look so good right now is the contrast. We go from a really dark purple to that really light purple, and that minimizes a lot of that. Um, one thing that I do a lot with my airbrushing, once I'm done with the surface, and we may play with that a little bit on this too, Eric, is I'll go back with an ink, and I'll glaze an ink over the surface a couple of times, and that tends to... Um, give a little bit more saturation of color to that surface so that it kind of gets rid of that, that airbrushed look. Uh, I hope that, um, that answers your, your question on that one. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Plarzoid makes a good, a good point. Um, Jolly Roger Studios have got some beautiful work and they definitely have a unique style all their own. So um, nothing wrong with it. You know, everybody has their own taste. So. Um, let's see here. Uh, do you have videos up on YouTube as well or just Twitch? Yep, Matty uh, G2787. I do have videos up on YouTube. Um, and it looks like uh, someone linked that channel to, to the, the chat. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, S-D-E-C-L-E-E-N-E, -E -E. uh, Subclean, maybe. Yeah, thank you for posting that. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, uh, all of these um, Twitch vid streams that I do, these tutorial videos I do for clients, they all get broken down into one-hour segments and, and posted on YouTubes as, as uh, part one, part two, part three, etc. cetera. So, uh, Drolath has asked, uh, replied, um, Mostly it's just personal taste thing, yeah. Yeah, everybody's got different tastes when it comes to, uh, comes to models. So, um, so anyway, that, that looked like it was the only questions. I, maybe I shouldn't have cleared chat because there was a lot of uh, questions leading up to, to this evening. So, I mean, if that's all you guys want to talk about tonight, that's fine. Um, feel free to uh, um, email me questions if you'd like. Um, I can be reached, reached via redmodeling at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash redmodelingpaint. Um, here on Twitch, you can find me. I'm also on Twitter, uh, redmodelingpaint uh, as well, at redmodelingpaint on Twitter. And um, tomorrow, actually, is Wednesday. That means it's Whip Wednesday tomorrow, guys. So if you've got stuff you're working on, feel free to... Um, Post pictures of it up on my on my website at the Facebook page and and uh, spread the love and share uh, share what you're what you guys are working on. Uh, I'll give it another minute or two to see if any other questions come in on the chat. Looks like we had 15 people on air tonight, which is awesome. Um, 
excited. That's almost uh, as many as I had on the first night of broadcast. So thanks, guys, for the support. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, Eric, any other thoughts? Um, my, the last thing I have is I'm just curious about that the, the light purple glow as compared to the blue I was going with. And I'm just trying to think of how I, if I can maybe find you a better picture of something of mine that's using that. But I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what you're thinking of with that glove. You know, and, and, and honestly, I, I, think the, I think the blue works in the sense that, yeah, it conveys a glow. Um, but I think it also kind of clashes with the purple a little bit. And, uh, I mean, ideally what I think would look best would be a green glow, just to be honest. A necrotite green, I think that would look fantastic against that purple robe. Um, and if you want to make that change, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But... Um, yeah, I just. If you want to throw that next to it too, like I'm down to look at okay. look at anything. I mean, I came to you because I wanted your take on this. So. Okay. Uh, I'm eager to see it. Awesome, awesome. Um, uh, Plarzoid is asking: Is there a brand of paint you find easier to work with than others? Oh, good question. Um, in what way would be a, a follow-up question to that? I know there's going to be about a 30-second delay here before he replies to that. Um, so um, I'll give it a second on that, but let me just kind of give you my, my thoughts on, on the paints that I use. Uh, sitting up on my paint racks right now, I've got Scale 75 paints, P3 paints, Vallejo Model Color paints, Vallejo Game Color paints, Secret Weapon Miniature Washes, Badger Airbrush paints, and um, Createx air, Airbrush paints. Um, I really find that Certain colors and certain brands work better than others. Um, P3 airbrush is really nice. Um, the Badger airbrush paints, I'm just starting to use those. Those airbrush really nice. Um, so the delay is caught up. He's asking, um, is it easier? What paints are easier to mix? Give you better results? Less temperamental uh, through the airbrush? Yeah. So the P3 paints are really good through the airbrush. Um, the Vallejo paints, some colors do not like to be airbrushed. Um, I have problems with airbrushing their reds. I have problems with airbrushing their metallics. Now their, their model airline, those are a little different. They tend to do a little better. But um, I tend to use the, the Vallejos more for um, base colors when I've got to do that. Um, but any kind of two brush blending or wet, wet brush blending I'm doing, I like the P3s. I like the Skill 75s. They work really well for that. Um, the uh, the Game Air from Vallejo, I, I don't mind. I feel is even better than the uh, Model Air when it comes to the reds and such. I don't know if they actually did anything different, but it, it, like I said, doing my convergence, they felt a lot, a lot better coming out with the uh, Vallejo Game Air range. Awesome. I'm gonna have to look into that. I, I, um, I'm always, always loving to try new paints. So. Um, another question they, that came up in chat is, uh, when you say two brush blending, do you mean wet blending with two brushes or one brush with paint and one uh, moist brush, a.k.a. split blending? Uh, spit blending. Yeah, I'm referring to spit, bl spit blending there, using two brushes. Um, one brush is uh, applying the color. The second brush is um, uh, blending the color. So... So anyway, well, guys, thanks for, for being on tonight. Uh, Eric, thanks for being on. Some great questions. I hope you, you're getting a lot out of this. Um, we'll e email each other and figure out when we'll do this again. And um, really, everyone, thanks for being on tonight. Thanks for all the questions tonight in chat. Uh, when this gets posted up into YouTube, and, and uh, for those that are watching now on YouTube, uh, make sure to like the, the video uh, and subscribe to my channel so you can uh, know when new videos are uploaded. Hopefully this will be uploaded to YouTube tomorrow, and um, uh, you guys can, uh, can enjoy it uh, as long as you'd like. So uh, thanks again, guys, for being here tonight, and uh, we'll catch everyone a little bit later. Take care. I'll talk with you later, Eric. See you, man. Thank you for all this. Just great help. You bet, man. We'll, we'll chat later. See ya. Take it easy.